glad you came. So my talk today is regarding doctors and um, persons on the spectrum, which also applies to a lot of other issues like ADHD and um, even in elder, you know, corners of dementias and so on and so forth. So a lot of these are considered psychiatric illnesses, which when you think about it, and, and, and you know, if you were a fly on the wall in the room with a bunch of medical students and they're being taught psychiatry, um, eventually the medical students, some of them will start to wonder, well, what, what constitutes something as a psychiatric diagnosis or a primary psychiatric diagnosis? It really means we don't know what the cause is and the assumption is there's nothing biological going on, but boy, that's, nothing could be further than the truth for many people with autism spectrum issues, adults and kids. I see people of all ages, and I think those of you who live this every day, yourselves with a spectrum problem or have a loved one or a client or a person you know or you work with with these issues um, that, uh, that there are many biological problems that go along with IE medical issues. The question is are those medical issues part of what's causing the autism or making it worse or can you improve the autism? And I'm not trying to change anybody. I want people to not have pain. I want people to be able to think straight. I want people to be able to sleep. So um, medical problems happen, um, and so uh, there's just a separation of that whole concept and how to work with physicians if you choose to, uh, to get medical help with people. Physicians range anywhere from neurologists, psychiatrists, uh, who are board certified by the same board, which to me nothing could be they couldn't be more different. And then you have developmental pediatricians and, and generalists like myself who end up seeing more persons on the spectrum than some of those specialists do. Um, about half of this book is about the medical parts of how to arrange things with doctors and how to get the most out of your interactions with doctors. Sometimes that means five minutes after you sit down with the doctor, you get up and leave if it's not working. And sometimes that means you really work closely with the doctor. We typically are with patients for hours, but the bottom line is that um, many of the parents think that the kid won't be able to tolerate or the adult person that's very anxious or intense or needs to get up and pace or something like that won't be able to tolerate it in our offices. We've had one or two over the last better part of a couple decades that can't, you know, be there in the office for a long period of time, but by and large, it's been two maybe at the most. But by and large, even the nonverbal kids, uh, you know, I'll often say to them, this is your place. This is your place. And don't forget that doctor's office is your place. They may pay the rent and run the office, but that's really, you know, they're there to serve you. And I don't mean like a luxury, like a resort. They're there to help you and support you. That's my um, view of the humility it takes to be a doctor. And if the doctor doesn't think that, you know, about patients, then I think it's going to be hard for them to orient themselves and have their eye on the right eight